Welcome to a new episode of the Unicorn Bakery. My name is Fabian and today Sophia Benz joins me as a guest. Sophia is a general partner at Cherry Ventures based in Stockholm and better known uh, or earlier known for her time at Spotify. She was one of the first 10 people in the team um, led global marketing and until I think a few hundred million users, 3000 people. So a lot of time then joined Atomico also as a partner uh, later and then made the move to Cherry Ventures. So a lot of things we could talk about. And before I dig into the topics, uh, Sophia, very happy to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be on your podcast. I really love to, and I, I ask you the first time we uh, jumped on a phone call because I think that's so interesting to understand what makes people tick. Mm -hmm. You had a great career at Spotify. You were a partner at Atomico, a very well-known uh, European fund. Everybody was looking um, at what you're doing and especially your next move will be definitely realized by, by everyone out there because you're also somehow a star in the Nordics. And um, so everybody's looking. And then you decide for a seed fund in Germany that's not as well known today it seems to be a good decision because today cherry is like a very well-known european fund but back then it seems like a decision that i think a lot of people might not have taken or not understand so what made you like how did do you make such decisions and why did you come up with uh, cherry such a great question and i'm happy to talk to it i think it's always hard to leave something uh, it was also incredibly hard to leave my position at Spotify. I mean, in a way that is a, a dream job. So how do you know when it's time to go? Uh, for me, I think I just lead with my heart. <laughs> and if I have sort of a sense or urgency to, to go elsewhere, then I try and find out what is my next sort of step. And when it came to sort of me leaving Atomico and joining Sherry, uh, for me, it was incredibly clear <laughs> and, and it stemmed from that I had done, uh, if it was two or three annual investments where Sherry were the first uh, institutional money in. So they did the pre-seed round or seed round. So I knew of the guys uh, because we worked together on companies. And for me, they always stood out. Um, I think we sort of shared the same sense of uh, kind of uh, both age and sense of humor, but also values and appetite and passion and drive. Uh, but uh, also a lot, I think, come from the VR all operators. It felt like home to me. <laughs> it's not a, a you know banker culture at Cherry. It's more or less like a entrepreneurs that are investing. And uh, uh, that resonated a lot. And I think, you know, at, a, at Atomico, I learned a lot and I met so many talented people. For me, that was the first time I got to work with people that were investing as professionals. You know, before that, I had only angel invested. So it was an incredibly steep learning curve and I really enjoyed it. But after four and a half years, I definitely felt, you know, when thinking about how do I <clears throat> come into my best sort of element, how do we optimize me according to kind of what I can bring to the table, then I realized fairly quickly that I'm, you know, I'm more of an early stage investor, being a former operator, having a strong sort of deal flow within the angel networks that I had built, it felt very uh, natural to, to gear towards an early stage fund. And, uh, yeah, for a long time, I was thinking, you know, should I stay at Atomico and try and, you know, have us do early stage deals, etc. But then I just felt like, no, let's, uh, let's try this path. And, and I'm very happy that I did so. Uh, and I think, you know, you never know, but uh, it's been, for me, I think, an even better product market fit, <laughs> so to speak. I, I really enjoy what I do and with whom I'm doing it. I also think uh, we, we prioritize differently and we like different setups. I really enjoy being a small, true partnership. It is a big difference being four investment partners and being 10 plus investment partners. And I, yeah, I appreciate the team setup we have at Cherry. For everyone listening and not knowing uh, what Cherry is, Cherry is a European seed fund based in Berlin, like uh, founded here from two uh, founder, uh, like people um, from the Salando founding team and uh, then uh, extended uh, their, let's say, angel vehicle into a um, proper VC. And I think quite well known uh, in Europe, what I realized over the time. So just to give a bit of context here. Um, so what you talked about is hard leaving um, your job or your position and finding the spot and then also 
taking decisions for yourself. Walk me through or walk us through the time where you decided, okay, now I'm leaving Spotify. It seems to be, if, if I look at it, um, a few hundred million users, I don't know the exact number, um, then also 3,000 employees uh, living in New York. It sounds like the top of the top that's that's happening at Spotify, um, but it was pre-IPO. So why was that the perfect time to to leaving such a company in such a hyper-growth um, scale-up? Is, yeah, that is also a really interesting question. And I think look, looking back, uh, there were a few things that uh, informed my decision. One was that I had been with the company for seven years, um, eight years. So I I was also a bit, uh, I've been obsessing about Spotify 24-7 for a very long t- period of time. I love the early stage years. I love when you roll up your sleeves, you create something and it comes out the day after. Like when you can be fast moving, nimble, you are involved uh, and, and the whole team is kind of informed. Um, when you are uh, three, 4,000 plus, you have a lot of processes in place, which is, you know, that's correct. That's what should happen. Uh, so the company was at a phase when we started to prepare for an IPO. Uh, so that is also, I mean, I'm, I'm a person who loves to start projects, but I'm not the caretaker eight years in. Uh, and then the second thing, uh, I had also kind of as a mission to launch in the US. That was a very um, uh, important, lengthy, uh, intense project. And when it was up and running and we had our beautiful <laughs> big office and, you know, lots of users, I also felt like, great, achievement unlocked. Now we did this. Uh, and then the third, I had a baby. <laughs> so for the first time, for a long period of time, I took some time off and, and actually something else was more important than work. So I think, you know, I uh, I landed in that, you know, I should leave before I turn into the person who's like always talking about the the good times in the early years, or when I uh, also felt like I wanted to move from New York to Stockholm back to my family. Uh, so I think I was just ready for a new chapter in life. Interesting. Can you also walk us a bit through the early days, like that we can understand um, what the startup ecosystem looked like back then, and also what it looked like building Spotify? Because right now we all know only. Everybody, like everybody knows Spotify and it feels so huge, but uh, I think nobody can understand the struggle that it really has been in the early days. So I think yeah. it's very important to get some context to also understand what you were building back then. Cool. Yeah. And I agree. I think sometimes it's uh, it's good to talk about just to remind everyone that everybody starts out, you know, somewhere and, and small. Um, so when I joined, this was 2007. Back at that time, there wasn't really... Uh, you know, you didn't really talk about joining a startup. That saying wasn't around. Uh, I thought that, you know, the most uh, cool job you can have was to be, you know, either at Deloitte as a risk management consultant, <laughs> where I started my career, or as a PR consultant. So the startup world didn't really exist as an option for me, at least. Uh, but I was uh, introduced to Daniel and Martin through actually my older brother who had worked for Martin. Uh, so I had a reference uh, point there and I could sort of reference the two. And then I remember thinking in my mind that, you know, either I try this and uh, I can always come back to being a consultant. And then I hopefully have more experiences and will be even better at it. But of course, it was way too exciting <laughs> to leave and go back to being a consultant. Uh, so I, yeah, it led to me staying there for eight years and uh, sort of growing into the role as a global marketing director in the beginning my uh, business card that we had at the time just said marketing and communications. <laughs> and for a long time, it was just me uh, in the team. But to give some context, yeah, we were based in a very small flat in Stockholm. It was not an office. It was a, a very small flat. <laughs> uh, we had the first servers in, in a wardrobe. <laughs> we have an incident where there's a cleaning uh, um, help that uh, actually pulled the plug from the server. So the <laughs> servers went down. Uh, we have a, you know, it was a, such an amazing crew of people. Everybody were kind of superstars in their own right, in their own field. Uh, so lengthy sort of philosophical debates and discussions over lunch about everything from, you know, tech architecture to Nobel Prize winners, etc. Very idealistic, I would say. And also we were super young and naive. <laughs> uh, we, um, yeah, we kind of quickly grew out of that office and then eventually moved into a proper office. And eventually we uh, uh, also hired more people than developers and then uh, had a bit of a more blended culture because, you know, when you add finance and marketing and uh, 
communication and lawyers, etc., you have a bit of a, a more blended culture. But I would definitely say that, uh, you know, at Spotify, it was always kind of developer first mentality and culture uh, and product led company more than anything else. You said you were a product-led company, an engineer-driven company. Yeah. How does brand fit in there? And how easy was it to say, <laughs> oh, we're building a brand now? <laughs> no, I mean, it, it didn't really have <laughs> much room for brand or much appetite for brand. So, uh, yeah, I, I've told this anecdote before. But um, so I was hired and my job was to oversee all the touch points, uh, you know, with regards to consumer. Um, so that was, you know, in the beginning, oh, we need a web page and uh, You know, how do we communicate? What is our brand all about? Why do we matter? And how, what do we want to stand for? But it was uh, not an easy <laughs> task. Uh, the idea from many of the developers were that we were going to be the matrix of music and be some sort of underlying technology for everyone who wanted to listen to music online. My argument was that, no, we need to build a direct-to-consumer brand. And that wasn't a clear case with everyone. So I actually gathered a group and I, I did a, a presentation. I think we had 12 slides where I talked them through, you know, what are the benefits? What is a brand? And then what are the benefits of having a brand? So what was the key argument that made you win? I don't know. You ask them. <laughs> I think looking back, you know, we could do some amazing partnership deals where some old, you know, legacy brands wanted to sit next to our brand. That was very helpful. So um, I think it was a, the right decision, if you ask me. And then also going back to that time, I mean, like today, branding and marketing and everything, like everybody knows how to market an app, how to market new services. But you were building a brand for something that was like in the making. And uh, I think it also, um, as far as I know and heard uh, interviews of Daniel, but also uh, read about Spotify, it was not easy, like saying, we just launched a product. It was so much stuff to do. So how do you... Um, start building a brand and when does it like when had did you have the feeling that like we're onto something and people also know about it not only us yeah no that's an um, interesting phase uh, I think for us it was when we because when I spoke about it just explained what we were doing it didn't really make people super excited when I talked about yeah we're building a digital music service people didn't really you know jump off up and down their shares directly but when they try the product then you could tell that they were hooked. So uh, when we launched a beta test and a few people who we knew uh, were allowed to try it and the reactions from that test, I think that really made me understand that, all right, we have a, a strong product market fit. There's a, a huge demand for this product. And uh, now we need to you know, put it in the hands of, of users, but in a controlled and scaled way so that we didn't compromise quality. And then also... I, I, I quickly uh, hop into um, like um, as we're talking about story a lot at the moment mm. um, and, and Netflix made the effort to to publish a, a series on it. Like how I, th I can imagine a lot of people listening also know the series. Mm -hmm. Like how close are they to like also really showing what, what happened and what would you say? How happy were you um, being portrayed in there? Like what do you think in the end of the playlist? Oh, that's a Yeah. Yeah, I don't really know if I have digested it all yet, but I have a few reflections. First of all, yeah, I want to explain that none of us from the early years were part of participating and in giving information about the uh, the real uh, time there. So we didn't participate in, in the making of the series. Uh, watching it, of course, it's really strange watching someone try and enact uh, sort of your early days of your career. Um, I think, you know, they, they managed to capture maybe the excitement that we had. We were more or less obsessed about this idea. Uh, we were an incredibly, ex I mean, extreme team in a way, because we had talent that was uh, uh, world-class. Um, I think what the series didn't really uh, do well was to describe how kind of visionary Daniel and Martin actually are, I think, uh, at least for me watching it. But of course, I'm biased. But I, I, did, I mean, they are incredibly... Uh, fun to work with because they had this view and idea of how are people going to behave, you know, in a number of years time. And then we executed something based on that belief. And I think in the series, yeah, I think they come across as, as a bit grumpy and, and weirder than they are. I think they, the, the real years were more exciting than, <laughs> than, the, than the TV series actually shows. 
So TV is still not reality, <laughs> even <laughs> when Netflix <laughs> tries yeah. to do it better. Yeah, they say based on true story, but yeah, no elements are are there. So let's go from story a bit more into into execution, and uh, also, um, I know uh, you did like forty plus angel investments, I think, and then also um, a few deals with Atomico, a few deals mm -hmm. with uh, Cherry. So you have a lot of founders you're working with. And I can imagine that a lot of them want to build a brand as well. And from your experience at, at Spotify and then also working with these founders, what does an actual brand and marketing strategy really um, come to? Like, what are the cornerstones of a good brand marketing strategy that I as a founder, if I'm currently thinking about how can I um, scale that and also like my company, but also brand and marketing, what do I have to think about? Um, I think, I mean, I at least look for some raw elements of, uh, I don't really know what to put uh, word on it, but, but you can sense when certain products or services or founders have this natural urge or ability or passion to create a brand uh, filled with values and dreams and passions. Um, I think I think you can sense when someone is sincere or when someone, you know, is trying to put together a business model and then sell it off a couple of years later. Um, I think for you know consumer brands, what is important is to try and figure out. Uh, I mean, a you need to you need to know what's your purpose in this world and what kind of mission are you on. Is it to free up and make all the world's music easily accessible for everyone? If you know that that's your truth, then you have a reason for being in many situations where music is. Then you can see yourself as the technical catalyst or something, and you have a natural place in the conversation around everything regarding music or artists. For us, that was an incredibly powerful position to own. Uh, and we could do you know, really exciting stuff like collaborations with artists where You know, we had Britney Spears and Justin Bieber seeding their fan bases with Spotify invites prior to the US launch. And the likelihood that the fans will pick that up is pretty high because they look to their idols. And if, if, if your idol tells you, check this out, you know, then they do it. So we could tap into bubbles of fans and communities that already existed. I think that is a, a grateful, you know, approach. So for instance, if you would be, say, a, a brand acting within the space of football, then you can be everywhere where football is. And then you need to figure out how do we go about it? Normally you want to have a digital presence and you want to have a physical presence. I would also say, let's figure out who are your ambassadors and how can you make it easy for them to always mention and sort of share knowledge about your brand. So yeah, that there, I, I think it's the most fun part uh, ever in, in, in building. So there's no, this is how you do it, because it's different depending on what sector you're in. But I think figure out what is the um, key selling point is one of the most important things that you need to do early on. I have a feeling that a lot of uh, founders are like, okay, we have to do brand and not more like we really love to do brand. And then also just like, come up with the first thought and just use it instead of just really getting it like sitting together with the team or like getting in themselves and like thinking about what they really want to focus on and what they really want to build and then also are not like focusing on okay what's the actual vision and how big can this be just like how big do i have to tell it can be that i just like come on until this point that people give me money or i can just start with whatever and not really um, also try to incorporate their vision. I'm not sure if that's something that you, maybe not in the companies that you uh, support, but if you if you see this overall um, through through the founders you got to know, or if that's just my perception. No, but I agree with you. I think sometimes when you're deep into it, you're so in the details and you're so kind of fully informed about what you're doing. So you tend to forget that you need to inform everyone else. And I think it's a really important skill to have to tell your story and you tweak it from time to time, depending on who you're talking to. But I think, you know, it's it's important when you hire top tier talent. If it's not clear who you are, what you stand for and where you will go, it's hard for people to get excited and, you know, join your company. If you're not good at explaining the size of the business opportunity and 
where you're going with your brand when you speak to investors. I think then it's hard to get the funding. So storytelling per se, I find is really, really important in order to succeed. And I think maybe that's why sometimes you see, you know, you have a brilliant piece of innovation created by a scientist, but maybe the scientists want to be, you know, continue to do uh, explorations in the lab and then it can get stuck. Like you need someone who can shout about it and tell the world and make people understand out of all of the 100,000 messages that we get each day, why do I need to look into this one? And in order to get your attention, you need to be clear with why is this a good product for you and why should I choose you over all of the other services out there? Because now it sounds like, yes, yeah, Spotify were good, but there were a lot of other players out there. We had Groove Shark, Spiral Frog, you know, um, Deezer, uh, the Norwegian streaming service. So there was a lot of competitors. It's not like we were the only ones. And I think seeing then who survived, I think it's about repeating over and over again <laughs> the message that you want to convey. For how long is it translating the vision of the founders into how can I communicate this also with customers in a way that it's like understandable for them because I cannot tell them where I want to be in 15 years because it's sometimes also hard. And when does this loosen up? Like, do I ever or do I always like try to stick with the vision of the founder? Does it all, at some point like um, untangle a bit with, from the founder? Like, how does my storytelling as a company is uh, how long is it tied to the founders? I think ideally it don't need to be tied to the founders. I think the founders is the one putting a name on it, phrasing it, coming up with it. If it is, you know, unlocking or if it's like Google's, like organizing all the world's information, it's not tied to the founders. Like they started it, they set up the structure, the hire the team, but it's a machinery going. I think normally you set out with one in the beginning and and it's it's preferred if it's something that you can tweak along the journey so for instance spotify in the early days we said we're you know we want to pr provide all the world's people with uh, all the world's music so access was the key thing that we pushed then later on we realized that it's actually a bit stressful to have all the world's music available at your fingertip uh, it's like a big dark hole what do i actually want to listen to so then we geared towards sort of discovery. And I think we rephrased it to the consumer, uh, the right music at the right time. And we wanted to serve you with playlists for, you know, work mode or running playlist or family dinner or holiday playlist, etc. So we wanted to help and be more proactive with what you should listen to. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that's also so important to understand because a lot, a lot of founders are in the early stages, like trying to tie a lot around their themselves persona, and yeah. their persona just because of ego and i think founder egos are also in my opinion one of the biggest problems out there that we have because they are like i want to do it can be fundraising it can mm. be storytelling it can mm. be just hiring many more people just because of the sake of telling people mm. that you have like 100 people in the company so how or what are you advising your founders on um, that you invest in regarding managing their egos and making the right decisions and not like letting ego take over. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting subject. And I think if you have a big ego, it's hard to survive well in a startup because at least maybe easier if you're the founder, but if you're employed and the company grows super fast, it's hard if you are going to be the protective type and be like, oh no, this is my remit. That is going to be hard. You need to evolve as quickly as the company is evolving. And that's hard. Not everybody is good at it. I think you need to kind of love change. You cannot be nostalgic. <laughs> you cannot be too sentimental. You need to kind of realize that it's a, it's a wave you're on and you need to ride it. Otherwise, you lose the opportunity. And when it comes to founders and their egos, I think what I look for and try and navigate away from are founders with too big of egos. I think, you know, the best conversations are the ones where you leave the ego by the door. I think uh, to one extent, it's good to have a, a strong persona so that you can convince people that I'm a strong leader. We are on this mission. You know, I and the whole team will take us to that place. But the mission of the company and the company itself should be bigger than your ego. 
And maybe that means that sometimes you need to think, you know, should I step down as a CEO? Is it better that we hire someone externally? Or does it mean that I need to totally rethink what I thought was the absolute truth? Yes, probably. You need to have a growth mindset uh, in order to thrive, if you ask me. I also agree. And uh, people often ask me, what's the best episode you ever uh, recorded? And I'm always like, it's not the best episode. It's more like, who are the people that I really admire out of the hundreds of interviews? And it are the, these are the people that are like, I'm not the only person responsible for the success of my company. I founded it, but there was this and that person. Mm. They are still humble. They are uh, very aware that a, a lot of luck was involved as well, even when it was hell of a grind. Mm. Like, And you can always like, in my opinion, um, understand who is doing it for the money and who is doing it because they really, really wanted to change something. Yeah. And especially during the last two or three years that we had where everybody was like, it was very easy to raise money compared to the times before. Yeah. And we had a lot, have or had a lot of founders. I hope, hope we had because it means they, they are now building because they really want to build. They were like, okay, I can do this model, take it from A to B, then I am at this valuation. I can do some secondaries and I'm set for, for a while. <laughs> And I think that was very unhealthy for, for the ecosystem if we have these founders, but also these might be the companies that sh were, will be shut down first and then uh, employees yeah. will um, hand it around anyway. I think it's a very mechanical and transactional way of going about your life if you start a company with that purpose. I totally understand that there are people doing that and I, I see it, same, to you, same as you. Uh, from my perspective, I, I get a kick out of meeting someone who's on a mission You can tell that their whole being is fueled by wanting to solve this one hard problem. Like that is what I admire and that I get excited about because then there's never a question if this person, you know, in two years time will do an exit and, and uh, do something else. I know that they have dedicated their life to solve this. And normally you see more of those, I think, in this sort of impact space, uh, which I find super you know, exciting. I think also... Human beings, we, we love being part of something that is bigger than ourselves. So for me, that experience was, you know, my years at Spotify. I could never have done it myself. My team was like my family. Seeing them evolve and grow was like the, the greatest uh, thing ever for me. And feeling that I was one piece of a very big puzzle and that we in the end managed to you know, get to a position where we only dreamt about being in the early years. That is incredibly satisfying. So when I meet some of my older colleagues today, it feels like we've been out and, you know, been through war together. It's almost like we hug and almost start crying and laughing at the same time because it's just such an intense experience. And you bond incredibly well when you are in those situations because you need to trust the one next to you when it's uh, windy <laughs> and, and hard. So for me, I, I have said this before, but I think the most, um, one of the things that I, I really enjoyed with my years at Spotify is the, the very close friendships that I made. I can imagine that's also like the feeling of trust of 100% that you're like, okay, we're yes. doing this project and I know that we will make it because this and that person is working with on uh, on it with me. It's such an incredible feeling. And I think um, that's so important for, especially in a time where everybody thinks, okay, we're not set up for success if, from outside perspective. Yeah. You have to have this and develop this. Otherwise mm. you will not like be able to go through everything that's that's happening because mm. it's not like a fun ride. It's mm. like a, a freaking it's roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> freaking roller coaster. Even not like Absolutely. experiencing it, but uh, yeah. just, just hearing from so many people. Without that um, trust and relationships, it's just not possible. No, and it's also too hard and too draining on you if you can't trust your crew. I think, you know, when you are out there, you you need to be like a well-oiled machinery so you can execute fast, especially when, you know, you have a number of product features that are being launched, you're rolling out in new countries, you're hiring people, everything is happening at the same time. So if you don't have a functioning team, you won't be able to make it. You're going to break And I think for me, having that team uh, working so well, that was incredibly, that's something I'm super proud of. Let's quickly have a chat about uh, consumer startups and, and B2B startups. You definitely are a person uh, experiencing what it means to run a or build a successful consumer startup. And do you think, or what do you think about the tendencies that we see in the investor uh, space where a lot of people are like, ah, we're just focusing on B2B because we can then crunch the numbers better and we are yeah. like, 
um, this in that matrix and after that matrix we're just investing otherwise we won't or we will just wait until they reach it or not and um, just leaving out consumers uh, consumer businesses often um, is it just a feeling of the consumer founders because it's also as hard, and, and it's the same feeling for the b2b founders as well or is there a tendency a strong tendency towards uh, b2b yeah i think the appetite for direct consumer investments definitely have sort of lowered in the last couple of years uh, for me, I'm not scared of investing in a, a direct consumer brand. I think it depends on who the investor is. If you are someone who wants to lean on numbers and crunch them and then make an informed decision, I get it. It's going to be harder uh, with the consumer brand. For me, I look for different parameters. I think, you know, trying to explain it later, I think I'm, I'm looking for the founders that are, you know, fueled with this passion to solve a problem. Normally, it's a problem that they themselves have experienced or bumped into in their journey. Uh, and also that uh, the reason for being for this brand is, you know, really relevant. Like there's a, something that needs to be fixed. And, and also that there is some sort of true and raw element in it that can turn into a brand. So for me, I have a few things that I look for. And then that, you know, doesn't really scare me to make those bets. What would you say are characteristics of a, like how how early can you um, determine success for a consumer company? Because for for B two B we have these metrics like okay uh, we have the lifetime value, we have the net revenue retention, and we have like a lot of KPIs that we're looking at and are like okay they are pre product market fit but close to it or they have product market yep. fit and whatever. What characteristics or do you at least at all use characteristics to say okay? That's a company that will um, be way more likely to succeed than any other deal that I'm seeing at the moment. Yeah, no, I do. Uh, and I think maybe it's characters or signals that I'm looking for. But there's one deal that I recently done uh, or did. It's not communicated yet. Uh, unfortunately, I can't mention the name. But uh, this one is kind of first time I spoke to them. It was more or less two founders and a deck. Uh, but a very deep knowledge about the space and a very big problem <laughs> that majority of the people are experiencing. So like a, a position in the market that is open, a team that is well-informed and strong enough, I believe, to be able to nail that proposition, both build it technically, but also build it brand-wise and communication-wise with some levers to uh, sort of strong partnerships. So that one is super exciting. And I think then, yes, I look for signals. And I think, yeah, experience, market, um, that the existing solution is really, really bad <laughs> and that there is a, a, almost like a, a desire for a brand in this space to pop up. And then, of course, it's about helping them, guiding them, coaching them, making sure that they work with the right creatives and the best people that there is in the industry. I think one interesting question um, that came up, I'd say, just in the last week uh, before our recording now chat gpt is all over the place and everyone is talking about it using it twittering linkedin like posting on linkedin about it yeah. what do you think does generative ai and maybe also chat gpt has or ai overall has as an influence for branding and marketing teams and how or also businesses at all and how do they have to think about leveraging them uh yeah super fascinating to follow and i think it will change a lot uh I'm just thinking about all of the different types of copy that we produced at Spotify. I think that <laughs> this AI can do it much better than we did. So for like some of the, you know, say drier, if you like, uh, copy that we produced in-house, uh, I would love to have had this AI assistant helping me with it. And I think there will be multiple use cases like that. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued uh, and also amazed <laughs> with how good it is. So marketing people and, and branding people will definitely use like, uh, will be more about not only being creative themselves, but also like leveraging the tools to make them work and leverage creativity yeah. and like being smart about the inputs you give an AI. To exactly. It will be a bit of a shift. I think, you know, I, I don't see it as, oh, humanity will not be creative because computers are, I think actually, uh, you know, we will be probably more creative because we have a, you know, a sparing partner, a sounding board. I think, you know, this could be, 
uh, used for uh, you know one portion of the work, and then the creatives can then get more time to work on the conceptual ideas, etc. But also explore and play with it because it's probably gonna create some stuff that we now even have a hard time to see. But I've also seen some beautiful images created with AI. Uh, so I'm thinking for you know people in the movie industry, uh, you know commercials, etc. So many opportunities out there. I think that's so important to understand that it's like enhancing what we do and not like uh, um, killing creativity or anything. No. I also uh, I put in. Um, could you uh, give me some questions for the um, former out of global marketing Spotify and this and that? <laughs> the interview questions were quite good. They were just like a bit um, superficial, like very high level. So I decided yeah. not to take any of them. But it was like so they they gave me like ten questions, and I could have done an interview with that. So if I would start a podcast from scratch, I would not yeah. have my focus yet. It would have been an amazing interview just okay. by like giving them like three lines of of, yeah. of text. I think, I mean, we should probably get used to that most occupations will have, you know, a little AI assistant helping us. Absolutely. And I think it's so, uh, so important. I have one, like two more things before I have like two, three small questions. Yeah. One is if I have you here, I definitely quickly have to talk about the Nordics, yeah, like sure. Northern, Northern Europe, mm -hmm. Scandinavia. Um, what would you say, uh, especially in Europe, is the role um, of, of Scandinavia and how is it developing and how has it developed since you started out in the startup ecosystem? Oh, yeah, man. Oh, good question. I think when I started out, there were no accelerators, no known uh, business angels that you could turn to. There were no meetups, uh, no co-working spaces. The word Streaming wasn't used because this was pre-Netflix. Smartphones didn't exist when I joined Spotify. So there's so much that have changed. Uh, today, there is so many kind of assets that you can use. And also technology-wise, like it's so easy to put together a company because you have so many free tools out there. So today you have, you know, uh, many, many meeting points, people, uh, the network, you have a lot of people that have made money from exits. Uh, so I think you have both kind of physical places to go, you have money, you have people, uh, and you have, I also normally mention this, I think the social security that we have in Sweden helps people to dare to start companies because you don't need to risk your whole family's sort of health insurance uh, in the same way as you might need to in the US or other places. So I think, you know, the Nordics is a great region to, to try and test and start companies. I think we have a lot of people uh, in a small space of uh, small physical space. So you can actually get hold of people. You actually bump into people in the streets. People are uh, happy to take a call or meet up for coffee. So I think it's a dense ecosystem. I think we have done really well, both in sort of gaming and entertainment with Spotify and King, obviously FinTech with iSettle and Klarna. And I think now also we see a rise of like impact led companies. So My hope is that we continue to do what we're doing. I think one of the reasons is also that we normally start out with the ambition to go global from day one because Sweden is such a small country. Maybe that have also fostered our that thinking. misses a lot of German people miss that. That's so hard. Yeah, and it's easier to operate in your own home turf, of course. But I think for us, it's not an option. Then you then you will build a too small company for yeah for the VC space. That's also what the Israeli founders uh, tell me often. And I'm like, yeah. that's so true. And it mm -hmm. also makes uh, such a difference. And a lot of the most successful German founders I know were like, okay, we knew we could start in Germany, but mm -hmm. if we do not internationalize quickly and try to figure out where's our actual market where mm -hmm. people really need us and not like try only to make it fit in Germany, um, they were like, These are the successful people. Yeah. Often, not yeah. always. There are there are business models mm -hmm. where you should localize and should start in Germany, for example. True. But um, sometimes often, it's good to do it quick. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, you can you can also think and and think mm -hmm. global um, makes a, such a difference as well. I agree. One thing that came from the community, and uh, I want to ask is you you scaled um, Spotify, you turned. From operator to investor, like angel investor, then VC, series A VC, then C VC. How do you keep up with that personally? How do you de develop yourself further so that you're keeping up uh, with all the challenges, all the new things? And how do you develop yourself further? I love this question. <laughs> uh, I would love any tips and recommendations from the audience. Uh, but the way I've done it uh, now is that I work with the coach. 
who kind of challenge me and, and gives me homework and makes me uh, challenge my perspectives, etc. And then I try and read a lot. But of course, as always, there's so much good stuff out there to both listen to and read. So I have this massive pile of books and I, I uh, <laughs> sort of have a lot of podcasts that I want to listen to. But I would say kind of working with a coach uh, is has been really helpful for me. And uh, one for, like I think that's very important. Um, yeah. One 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 sentence or one uh, thing we should keep up. Even like all of the founders are like, oh, I have to be good enough. I cannot um, tell anyone that I have the feeling of being overwhelmed. Mm. I think it's completely different. You mm. should tell everyone that you feel overwhelmed. And you're yeah. trying to figure out the best system you can operate in uh, with having help from mm. all the different sides to then also develop yourself mm. further. And I think that's yeah. something we have to talk. Uh, more often about and i think vcs are starting with that and uh telling people to hey get coaches oh, you need absolutely. it but it was not that way for a long time no but i think it's kind of silly you know i have a personal trainer in the gym uh i have someone helping me with uh, you know if i would renovate my house i would get someone who's an expert on uh, architecture we have experts in all these fields why should we not have it for the greatest asset of all our brain i find it too fascinating not to have it Uh, I have also been to one of these 10 days silent retreats, uh, which was incredibly helpful at the time because I was a bit overwhelmed. I, I needed it at the time because I had a lot of sort of big shifts happening in my life. Uh, so I also know the power of meditating. Uh, I have a hard time implementing it in my daily life, but every time I do it, I feel like I'm almost rebooting my uh, internal system. And we know that that's necessary and, and healthy. So... It's just, I, I would love to, and I always recommend, like, it's not one recipe for all, but for me, I think, you know, being in nature, being completely disconnected and not on any device and meditating and uh, just sort of having some downtime. Before, I didn't really realize that we need to sometimes rest to get into shape, if you see what I mean. I thought that I was supposed to be productive all the time. But if you are thinking that you will be productive all the time, then you probably will, will be worn out and not as strong as you need to when you hit that home run. So I think it's about, I find it super fascinating with uh, sort of sports psychology as well, because it's the similar mechanism. You need to guard your energy levels and really use it when needed, and then also know how to recharge your batteries. Another thing I would love to add is you have a lot of people around you, and I always try and create a psychology uh, or a, a safe environment so that you know um, psychology safety any questions or any topics should be allowed if it's a smaller team and i think for me just having been able to share stuff uh, and then asking for feedback or support i think has been incredibly helpful so my philosophy is like don't keep anything to your chest rather share it with the ones that are your colleagues or peers or superiors uh, And ask for feedback if you need it. Like, get it from the people you have around you. One of the best things I did was when people asked me, how are you doing? I'm not just saying, hey, I'm fine. Everything is good when it isn't. Mm. No matter what bothers me, I'm like, the thing that I'm thinking about at the moment that keeps me awake is this and that. And you get so many perspectives from yeah. so many smart yeah. people, but also different backgrounds. It, it, doesn't know, it can yeah. be my parents, can be my best, best friend, can be founders, can mm. be VCs, can be wh whoever. But um, it helps me a lot because I get perspective. And totally. even talking about it and just explaining my problem sometimes yeah. solves it. I know. It's beautiful. And also I find it beautiful to share. And if you dare to open up, I think a lot of other people do as well. So for me, when I went through a separation and I actually didn't hide it, I told people who asked me the same you know, as with you, like, how are you? And then being able to say, no, I'm going through a very difficult time right now. And then you, I mean, it's so many... Uh, stories are unfolding and so many relationships get closer because you you dare to be vulnerable and i think that's a that's a good thing yeah absolutely and uh one other thing i wanted to add is if you're only like running around working and like not having the time to take off you will lose clarity and oh, without the clarity you're just running in one direction without knowing if that's the case where you want to be yeah and i think that's a thing a lot of people are missing and uh, should like for me It's like 10,000 steps a day for, let's say, 
roughly two years now, oh, which helps that, me a lot that's because super then good. Yeah. because that's uh, something I do like in the morning, in the afternoon, mm -hmm. or let's say also a walking meeting could be um, something that helps me a lot mm -hmm. um, to like I, I have to think about things. Yeah. Because uh, of course, even when I'm listening to music or podcasts, my my thoughts are drifting, and that's good. And then I pause the music and I'm thinking about that. And I'm like, oh, that is what bothers me at the moment. Good to know. And then I can. Uh, um, ass assess it and think about okay what does it mean but without that i'd sit <laughs> in front of my computer i'm like okay i have to do this task and this task and this task but i don't know why am i doing it where do i want to go no. you don't have to be that extreme as i am but i think it just helped me a lot and this is my kind of meditation yeah. i'd say to uh, have these one and a half hours a day where i'm like walking thinking yeah. about stuff talking to people that are important yeah. to me um even when uh, the days are very very stressful no, I think that's an investment in yourself. And we should never forget that we have the the power to engineer our lives, our days, you know, in, in whatever way we want it. If we want to do walking meetings, if we want to have no meetings before 10 o'clock, like you can put boundaries and you can figure out this is what works best for me. And also you can live in phases. You can have the summer with yeah. no meetings before 10 and then you yeah. can do in winter, you can be earlier or whatever. You can Absolutely. do whatever you want. Just... Uh, <laughs> And that's something I also see that people always think, oh, I should do this because other people would do it as well. Like also with choosing their job, choosing how they live their life and mm -hmm. not like thinking about what do I actually want and want to focus on and who am I? Yeah. I think that's... Uh, and also what's important for you like this success in the eyes of society might look very different from, you know, what is success for you? Is that to you know, live your life in a, in a certain way, in a certain country with, I don't know, access to nature and family? Or is it, you know, running the career ladder in a big city? I think, you know, just have the the thought process and, and be intentional, uh, I think is important. Cho make sure you choose your si own situation and not feel like you're trapped into it or fall into something that you didn't really decide to go for. Now I'll uh, add my last question here yeah, right, sure. for, for the interview. <laughs> and uh, it's one more that's also, I think, um, quite good for the, the philosophical part that we're talking about mm -hmm. at the moment. What advice do you give often but find hard to follow yourself? Uh, one advice I give often is that remember it's a marathon and not a sprint. At Spotify, when I was younger, I, I had a hard time implementing that. And I didn't take vacation for two and a half years because... I thought it was so important to the company. <laughs> so I think don't overestimate your importantness is probably also another advice that I'll give. Uh, and I think for me, same, you know, sometimes you get caught up in hundreds of meetings and running super fast. I think life is now, it's not later, it's today. You don't know if you have a tomorrow. True point. Sophia, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and, um, I'd be happy to give you the last words of the podcast. And if you want to say something to the audience, um, what they, what do you think um, they should hear right now? Then uh, here are your, here's your stage. All right. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's been great to chat to you. Now, I would just encourage the audience, if you're thinking about starting a company, do it. Be mindful, think it through, but go for it. We only have one life and make the most out of it. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you.